initial data or the boundary data, or you can assume that you have uh, uh, coefficients in your PDE that are uh, random, or you can take the source term, you add in some uh, stochastic source. So there are different ways you can add noise. So what I will do here today is to uh, try to review some of this recent activity where many different authors have uh, looked at different uh, partial differ differential equations and different ways of adding noise. So the relevant questions are uh, solution concept, what do you mean by a solution? Uh, existence, uniqueness, stability, uh, long time behavior, a convergence of numerical schemes and so forth. So there are many different equations. I will mainly talk about uh, uh, conservation laws, but let's start with transport equations. There, there has been uh, much activity there recently. And uh, so what you have here is um, uh, something driven by a velocity field. You're looking for a solution U driven by some velocity field B. Uh, so you can think of this as uh, something slowly varying, nice function, but then you would like to uh, capture, uh, let's say, turbulence. And then what you can do is to add this noise term. So then you take this slowly varying velocity field and you add a fast oscillating component driven by this, uh, white, uh, this uh, Wiener process. So what you see here, this is a Stratonovic uh, product. So this is called uh, transport noise. This is one way of adding noise to your uh, PDE. Okay. And Stratonovich here, this means that if you think in terms of transport of particles, uh, they, they, there is preservation. So the, in, ter in mathematical terms, you have the chain rule from deterministic analysis that continue to hold here. What I'm not uh, talking about here is that you typically have a stochastic basis uh, being fixed when you consider these equations. You have some probability, a probability space. Uh, you have some sigma algebra of uh, events, and then you have a filtration. And these, uh, these uh, Brownian motion, they are adapted to this filtration. Okay, so you can solve this equation assuming that B is smooth. What you do is that you set up the stochastic characteristics, and then you invert the flow, put it into the initial data, and you have the solution. This is what you have in the deterministic case as well. So what you want to do now is to push the regularity on this velocity field. You want to have it as rough as possible. If you turn off the noise, uh, what you have is that you can push this down to, let's say, W11 in the spatial variable of the velocity. This is uh, the Parnell Leons and uh, so forth. Now it turns out that if you add noise, and this is why there is some interest in this kind of transport equation, is that you add noise. Uh, there is a regularizing by noise phenomenon taking place here. So you can actually get well posedness under lower conditions or better conditions than what you used to in the deterministic case. So typically, what you get is that you can get, uh, let's say, existence and uniqueness, for example, uh, under, under the assumption that you have some healthy continuity in the, in the x direction of the velocity field. So this is uh, better than what you have in the deterministic case. And this is regularization by noise, is an example of regularization by noise. So different ways to see why this phenomenon is there. The, the simplest one is perhaps this. So what you can do is that you can focus on this equation I have written here. This is just the equation we started with. So you have the Stratonovic interpretation of Stratonovic uh, noise. And then you can turn this into an Ito equation. So here we have the Ito uh, product. And this is then a martingale taking the expectation. This term goes away but you gain this uh, Laplacian. But it's important to realize that it's not this Laplacian as you see it here that is generating this regularization. Because if you try, to, for example, to compute the energy of this equation, you will see that the energy is perfectly uh, conserved. There is no dissipation, right? So this is a more subtle effect. So uh, what you can do is that you can take, let's take a nonlinear function beta and then let's try to renormalize this Stratonovich formulation of the equation. And since you have the chain rule, you know that you get the same equation for beta of u. But then you, t then you turn to uh, uh, this uh, Ito form and you take the expected value and you get this equation here. And here you can see that if you take the expected value of a nonlinear function of u, you get something that satisfies a parabolic equation and you expect to get some better result with lower assumptions on the velocity field than in the transport case. So this is one way of seeing this regularization effect. 
there are also other ways. Um, you can generalize this to fractional Brownian motion. So what you do then is that you leave this stochastic uh, calculus and uh, you try to take your uh, rough signal and embed it into a rough part. And then you have to use this so-called rough part uh, theory. And the nice thing then if you go to this rough part framework is that you can push this all the way to a fractional Brownian motion for which stochastic calculus is no longer working. And then you can still have regularization by noise. In fact, uh, the rougher this signal is, the better this, uh, this uh, regularization effect uh, becomes. Okay, so let's uh, now do something different. Let's, uh, so this is one way of adding noise to your equation. So you take the gradient, so this is a transport noise. Let's drop this, and let's take this to be a non-linear instead. And then you end up with these equations. And this is uh, some, uh, often called stochastic conservation of the rough flux, and this uh, there is a uh, number of papers now, uh, due to Leon, Sugan, Idelsan, Parkham, and many others, that deals with this nonlinear uh, noise. So the idea here is that you have my problem. Okay, so you have a nonlinear flux here. So this is a generalization of this transport equation to the nonlinear setting. So you have the Stratonovich uh, product here, and you have some driving signal. You can think of this as a function uh, that is rough. So let's say Hölder continues, for example, a Brownian path. And the, uh, the question is, uh, the point now is that everything is nonlinear here now. And um, so what these authors have attempted to do is to set up a theory here so that you can actually avoid this stochastic calculus. But at the same time, you would like to get rid somehow of these stochastic integrals here because they are rather, rough, uh, rather uh, they beha uh, behave rather nicely. So there is a many papers now that devoted to existence, uniqueness, stability, uh, long time behavior and uh, so forth. So where do you get these equations from? Well, they are, you can think of them as uh, an example of mean field games. So imagine now that you have a system of uh, many agents. So these uh, agents, they are interacting, and they are interacting through this uh, nonlinear function sigma here. So you have a stochastic differential equation in a Stratonovic sense, uh, driven by some nonlinear function, and this sigma depends on the solution, of course. But what is new is that you, in addition, assume that the equation um, uh, for agent number i depends also on the mean field of the remaining agents. And if you do that, take that as a uh, starting point, and you look at uh, many interacting agents, and you compute this empirical measure, and you take the number of agents going to infinity, what you get formally in the limit are these uh, uh, stochastic conservation laws with uh, a rough flux. So this is one way of motivating this kind of noise. So what is the solution here? Well, what you can do now is that you can say that these, uh, you can think of, uh, think of this just as an ordinary product, and then you take this W to be a path of a Brownian motion. So this is going to be a Hölder continuous function. So this is very rough. But then you uh, assume that you regularize that function, and you think of it as a smooth. And then somehow what you want to do is to find a solution concept in which this regularity of this, uh, this path or this function does not enter so that you can take the limit afterwards to def define solutions for the original equation. The chain rule holds here if you assume that everything is smooth so you can write these entropy inequalities for any convex entropy S. But of course, what you can also do if this function is smooth is that you can write a kinetic formulation. So you use this indicator function chi, you let it depend on one more variable, uh, xi, and then you can represent any nonlinearity S of u in terms of this uh, kinetic function. And if you do that, you can take all these inequalities, an uh, infinite family of inequalities, and you can write them as one single equation for a higher dimensional object, namely this chi function. And then you have the price you have to pay for all these inequalities being written as one equation is that you need this so-called 
defect measure M, which is a non-negative bounded uh, measure. So this is, uh, this is precisely what you would, would do in standard conservation law theory, right, is some, uh, right is, uh, like this. But the problem is that you still, if you want something, a solution concept that is stable with respect to this noise, the regularity of the noise, you would need somehow to get rid of this. And the idea of uh, Leon's part um, Suganidis is that you, t you interpret this equation along the characteristics, the stochastic characteristics. So then you do something like this. So you solve the characteristics, set up the characteristics, and then you interpret this equation. Add some. Like this. But now, if you are willing to do that, take that as a solution concept, you see that what enters is just the path itself. And this is going to be a continuous function, but you're not going to see the derivatives of this uh, function. So starting from this formulation, you can get existence, uniqueness, stability, long time behavior, and so forth, uh, with respect to, let's say, the L1 uh, norm. So this is what they basically do. So this is the solution concept. But it's a part-wise solution concept, and you don't see any stochastics. You don't need a stochastic basis or anything like that to develop this theory. <coughs> OK, let's now uh, leave this transport noise uh, way of uh, putting noise into the PDE. Let us now take a rather large class of PDEs and add noise as some kind of uh, uh, energy pump, something that is injecting uh, randomly uh, something in uh, to the energy. So you have a convection diffusion and then you have noise. And then we would, what we would like to do here is to take noise to be uh, a temporal derivative of a Wiener process. So we're talking about white noise in the time direction. Uh, having noise in the space, uh, spatial direction, this is completely out of, uh, I mean, this is uh, too difficult uh, since these equations are so uh, nonlinear. So I will not touch on that topic. But I, I don't only want to use uh, the, 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 the time derivative of a Wiener process, but I would like to have more general Levy processes so there is some element of jump or surprise in these stochastic processes that I add in as a source term. So let's be a little bit more precise about the noise. So the, the simplest thing we can do here is just look at an ODE and then pass to the stochastic differential equation. So you would like to add in some no white noise. And this white noise, as I told you, I want to uh, think of as a derivative of some Wiener process, or more generally, a jump diffusion or Levy process like this. But if you want to do that, uh, then you have to look at this equation in a different way, as we all know. So you have to... Uh, you have to make sense, if you want to so insist on solving this equation, you have to make sense of these so-called stochastic integrals. And the way we interpret them here, differently from this uh, context of uh, uh, transport noise, is that we're going to take them as e to integrals, not Zeratonovich integrals. So not much you need to know about this as stochastic integrals, but what you should pay attention to is this Martingale property. Because if you're willing to fix one omega, one... Uh, um, uh, the, the random variable, you, fi you fix the random variable. What do you have? You just have a, you have a, a partial differential equation, a det deterministic equation with a source term. And why is that interesting? The reason why this is interesting is that this source term you're adding to your PDE has some magical cancellation properties. And this comes from this precisely this Martingale property of the E to integral. There is really some cancellation taking place, and this makes it possible to develop uh, some rather interesting results uh, for these uh, stochastic uh, PDs. Okay, I want to treat more, so we have to go to a little bit into detail about these stochastic processes that I would like to add to as a source term in my PD. So I want to treat now uh, a class of Levy processes. So roughly speaking, these are going to be processes that are uh, station that have increments time increments that are stationary and independent and you simply as uh, you only assume that they are stochastically continuous so this is uh, this, or this is the definition of a general uh, levy process but this is i mean this is too uh, uh, too general this will not help us when we want to put in uh, develop some theory for stochastic pdes it's too uh, general this form so we need to characterize these levy processes using the fourier transform so how can you do that? So you take the Fourier transform of a Levy process, X, a general one, 
And then you can write this in terms of what is uh, known as the, the characteristic exponent. And this characteristic exponent encodes all information about the relevant processes. And for example, there are three main parts. You have something driven by a number B. You have this term, quadratic term, driven by another number A. And you have this last term here, more nasty looking, driven by this a new. A new is the so-called Levy measure. This, in general, this is a singular measure, second order singularity. This captures the jump in this Levy process, the, 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 the big surprises. Uh, this is just a Brownian motion, and this is a drift term. So any stochastic uh, or any Levy process can be characterized like this. And this has this consequence that if you are willing to, uh, want to put some noise into your PDE, you have this decomposition. So you can take any Levy process. Let's assume now for the moment that it is a bounded measure. The Levy, so there is no singularity in the Levy measure. Uh, then you can write this process as some uh, drift uh, plus some Brownian component that we all know well. And then you sum up these jumps. But it turns out that this, this way of actually summing up the jumps is not very convenient. So what you do instead is that you start to count the times at which these jumps occur. And you give a name to this. This is called a Poisson random measure. And if you are willing to use this uh, Poisson random measure, then you can uh, write this decomposition like this. This is called the Levy E2 decomposition. So drift, Brownian motion, and this jump component involving the Poisson random measure. Now this is, to, of course, I made this assumption that you have a finite uh, Levy measure. And this, uh, of course, if you want to go to the general case with uh, an infinite amount of jump activity, you have to be more general. So then, um, uh, in the general case, this Levy E2 decomposition, it, takes, uh, it always uh, decomposes into drift, diffusion, and these jumps that we have just seen, these are called the big jumps. This is where the Levy measure is uh, finite. But then you have this infinite activity jumps. And here we have to be a little bit careful because we have to compensate these integrals. If you just use this counting measure here, or this Poisson random measure, it's not going to be finite. So you have to compensate for this uh, infinite activity jumps. So this is, has to be interpreted as a stochastic integral, uh, this term. So this is what we call the compensated Poisson random measure. We subtract basically the Levy measure. And this is to make these integrals convergence. But the point here is now, if, you're, if you are interested in looking at stochastic differential equations driven by a general Levy processes, then you see that you can write them as a drift term, diffusion term, this big jump uh, term, and then you have some nonlinear volatility function, jump volatility function, integrated against this Poisson random measure, and then you have this compensated Poisson random measure capturing the small jumps. So what we need to make sense to here are st stochastic integrals. We need to make sense of this stochastic integral, and we need also uh, this one, like this. But you do uh, both these in, uh, in the sense of E2. This is how we would deal with these uh, stochastic integrals. So this is how we would, if you now say that you would like to look at a stochastic differential equation with jumps, what you would do is that you take your general Levy process, you decompose it into these three different parts, and then you write a stochastic differential equation like this. And then you can either uh, study all this uh, uh, the equation with all these uh, parts, or you take out some component of interest. Okay, what we need when we go to the PDs uh, are, uh, uh, basically we need some kind of replacement for the chain rule, and this is going to be, of course, the, the Ito, uh, Ito rule, more generally Ito chain rule for these Levy processes. But if you have a, a diffusion process like this, then you take a nonlinear function, and you would like to compute the differential of this function, then you, ex you get precisely what you should get applying the, the usual chain rule, but then you have to add in this uh, well-known uh, Ito correction term that you have here. It's a quadratic term. Uh, in the volatility, in the, in the, the, in the noise coefficient. Uh, if you go to jump processes, so that we have these uh, big, uh, sm uh, small jumps, uh, big jumps, and then we have the uh, small jumps, and imagine you know, that we have some two different jump volatilities, then we would like to compute this differential. So we have uh, differential operators when you deal with continuous processes, but now we have to replace this by uh, difference, finite difference operators, like this. So this is the Ito chain rule or Ito Levy chain rule if you have a jump 
uh, the stochastic differential equation driven by jumps like this. So what you have here basically, uh, this is a difference operator, so you're jumping from where the solution is to where it ends up, and here this is the size of the jump, and the same here. But then you need also a certain form of this uh, E to correction term. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is the quadratic covariation, and you want to compute that for jump processes. It looks more complicated. It looks like this. So this is the correction term you need when you do the chain rule for these differences. So what this term is basically doing is that it's measuring the distance between the solution before the jump and where the solution end up after the jump. And how much it jumps depends on the nonlinearity in your problem F, like this. And what is this B? This is the, the norm or, or which we measure the distance before and after the jump. And this is a so-called Bregman distance. It's defined like this, but roughly speaking, this is the, it behaves quadratically in the jump size. This is what the correction terms, it's consistent with what you have for the continuous Brownian case. Okay, so let's uh, uh, now look, uh, go to some PDEs and try to add parts of this Levy E2 composition, the decomposition, to these stochastic PDEs and see what kind of. Uh, uh, first of all, let's see what should we mean by a solution to these kind of equations. First of all, if there are no noise here, we know very well that these are conservation laws. And even if you start out with smooth initial data, the, the solution will eventually develop shocks. And uh, so you have, somehow you have to go beyond weak solutions. You, are, you need some additional uh, conditions uh, to, uh, to model the chain rule in order to prove, for example, continu uh, uh, continuous dependence or uniqueness. And the same, uh, of course, you expect to be the case here. So it's a Wiener process, and it's, uh, this solution is uh, uh, assumed to be adapted to some underlying stochastic basis here. Okay, so how, how can we get a grip? Uh, on the, let's look at the solutions uh, space first. Where should we look for solutions? So either you can assume now that is u, if you want to play around with this equation, you assume it's smooth in x, continuous in t, or you can add some small viscosity term here to force the solution to be smooth in x and continuous in t. And then you can start to play around with Ito's formula on this equation. You take a nonlinear function, you apply Ito's formula. So this is my nonlinearity s. And Q, this is the corresponding entropy flux. Uh, so the point is that Ito's formula just gives you this. This is what you should have from the deterministic case. And then you have what comes out from the stochastic. And then you have this term here. This is a martingale term. So if you take the expected value of that, it vanishes. But this one you don't get rid of. So this is some kind of uh, entropy pump. I mean, even though uh, there is conservation because you have this nice cancellation effect in this very special source term that you have added to your PDE because of the martingale property of the stochastic integral. Uh, once you do a nonlinear manipulation of this equation, that uh, conservation is gone. There will always be some entropy that is being produced in this kind of equation because of randomness. Okay, so what you can get out of this equation here are uh, these bounds that you see here. You can get LP bounds and P, uh, take it to the P moment and expectation. And this is in some sense the space that you're going to use looking for solution to this equation. You don't reach L infinity in, uh, in general unless you have some kind of invariant regions principle, but that you need some uh, conditions on your coefficient. Okay, so what is the solution? Well, you ask for this kind of uh, integrability. And then you write uh, these entropy inequalities, I mean this Ito Levy or Ito chain rule is no longer here. So what you do instead, you replace the Ito formula by these inequalities and they should hold for all relevant pair of uh, entropy functions S. And this is what you mean by a solution, these two conditions. And if you want to write something similar for the, no uh, the, the pure jump case, uh, it, it's similar but uh, perhaps a little bit more complicated because of the jump nature of the noise. Okay, so the, question, the first question you want to ask is uniqueness or stability. If you define solutions like this, uh, do these solutions depend continuously on the data that you put on the problem? 
And uh, it turns out that uh, things are not that simple. So if you take two uh, solutions, uh, you and uh, two of these stochastic uh, entropies and subtract them, and you measure the distance in L1, you would like to show that the time derivative of this distance is, uh, is negative, or uh, at least not increasing. And the standard trick for doing that uh, is that you don't really look at the L1 norm, but uh, t take the direct delta function or some approximation of it, evaluate it in x minus y, and then you shift the point in which you're measuring u and v, and then you compute this distance here instead. This is a, this is a trick that you use to prove uniqueness in the deterministic case, because then you can use the stochastic entropy, or the, the entropy inequalities to write a uniqueness or stability proof. And we can do this now for the standard root. So what you do is that you take these two solutions. So you have one equation for u, which you evaluate in x, we have another equation, v, that we evaluate in uh, y. I want to, want to do is to compute the L1 norm of the difference between these two. So you add, so what the information that you have available is are the entropy inequalities for u and those for v, and you add them. And what happens uh, is these two terms that you see here, this is what you know very well from deterministic theory, but then you get this stochastic part that comes in here. So this represents a quadratic covariation, or this e to correction terms for these two uh, entropy inequalities. And then you have these, so this comes in naturally. So all this looks nice. And what you see here, this is the, the second derivative of the absolute value function. So this is a direct delta function concentrating at the points where u minus v is zero. So now we have two problems here actually, uh, preventing a naive interpretation of this uh, argument. And the first one is that no, ma no matter how you uh, do this, you have two variables, you have t and you have s. Depending on uh, whether t is bigger than s or not, these integrands, they're not going to be adapted to the underlying filtration. So you, go, you cannot make sense to these e2 integrals. So this is a, actually, a, this is a fundamental problem. So how to deal with that? And the second one is that if you add these two e to correction terms or these uh, covariation terms, you get something that is highly singular, like this, right? So this doesn't seem to add up. So then it turns out that uh, the first ones that did this was Feng and Nualar, and they realized that you, you need to take these conditions, but you, you must add so another piece of information to these uh, inequalities. And this piece of information looks like this. And this I'm not even going to explain to you the meaning of, because I think it's very difficult to explain what is underlying this uh, condition. It's very hard. So what I will do later is that uh, I will come back to this uh, condition, which is hard to understand, and then I would like to interpret this uh, in the context of Malyavar calculus. And then we will see that this condition is much more natural uh, when you view it through the lens of Malyavar calculus. So let's leave this for a while now. But the point is that you need to take these entropy inequalities and you need to add in some more information to deal with these non-adapted integrands. Okay, but now if you do that, so there are several ways of doing that, but as you know that you can do that, what you typically can prove for this class of equations where you take a conservation law and you add some Wiener noise. So now I'm taking out, if you remember this uh, Levy E to decomposition of a general Levy process, we had several parts there, so what I have done here now is take out the most impo two imp most important parts, the, the Wiener process, the Brownian part, and this part with small jumps. So this is an infinite activity Levy process, so this is the most uh, difficult part. So what you can prove here is that if you take uh, a stochastic entropy solution, you take a stochastic entropy solution via another one, which satisfies some additional condition uh, then you can show that you have this L1 stability result. So this additional condition, what it is doing is somehow to provide you with information about uh, the correlation between these two solutions. It seems that you need some information about the correlation between these solutions to, to provide this kind of inequality. Uh, you can prove more, you can prove continuous dependence. I will not go too much into details there, but the point simply is that you can uh, take different coefficients uh, let's say different uh, noise coefficients, and you can, uh, the, you, you can show how the solution is depending continuously on the, the, the difference between these coefficients, like this. So typically, you get something like this, two different noise coefficients. Uh, existence, 
one way of proving existence, for example, is uh, through BV estimates. This is what you do in a deterministic case. Now it turns out that if you want to take a noise coefficient here and put in an X dependency, and this seems harmless, but if there is a noise there, it turns out that you can no longer expect uh, BV estimates to hold for this equation because of the noise. But uh, you can get something which is uh, a substitute. You can get some fractional uh, BV type estimates. Uh, yeah. Let me also just mention that uh, several authors have recently looked at uh, can you set up, can you take some uh, numerical scheme? I mean, there are so many numerical schemes for uh, hyperbolic conservationals, the deterministic equation. And can you modify these uh, schemes so that you can get uh, conver uh, something that converges to these stochastic entropy solutions? And then the first one here is, uh, is by uh, Kröker and Rode. Then they do just a same semi-discretization, so there is no discretization in time, but they take some numerical flux that is well known for numerical approximation of conservationals. And this you can show converges to a solution, to classic solution, to a classic entropy solution. And this was generalized recently by Galloway and his uh, collaborators uh, to uh, where they also include a time discretization. Uh, the time discretization is more difficult because on one hand you know that uh, when you work with uh, um, uh, difference operators there is no uh, chain rule and on top of that you know that the, uh, for stochastic calculus there is no chain rule in the usual way as well. So there are some combination of difficulties when you want to discretize in time. Uh, there is another way you can do this. If you are willing to uh, depart from these uh, stochastic entropy uh, solutions and this idea of thinking along the lines of Krushkov, you can use kinetic formulation. This has been done by Wawel and Debu and many other authors. I will skip this. And there you can prove existence, uniqueness, stability. And what you do is that you basically write a kinetic equation and uh, this is going to be a linear equation. For example, if you have just this stochastic differential equation, you can write this linear equation for this as an uh, equivalent replacement uh, in terms of this chi function, this indicator function that we have. And from that you can actually also extract L1 stability, existence and uniqueness and so forth. Okay, so now I want to come back to this work by Feng and Duvalar. So this, what I'm going to talk about here now is a joint work with uh, Arlen Storesen, which is here. So, uh, the, so what we wanted to do is, uh, was to try to understand uh, this uh, additional condition that uh, Feng and Duvalar introduced in order to prove this L1 stability result in order to uh, establish well positiveness. So the starting point is this. Let's just look at this equation in one dimension. We have this uh, nonlinear flux and we take some sigma of u integrated against the Avina process. So what is this entropy condition that we would like to have satisfied? Well, if you use the entropy, just the absolute value, and which you index over some constant c, it formally writes like this. Here is the quadratic covariation, or this e to correction term. This is the martingale term, right? Now the problem was that it didn't seem to immediately imply uniqueness, this condition. So perhaps should we enlarge or should we look for more, uh, a bigger class of these C's here? So what we suggest is that uh, let's look at a certain class of random variables. So we'd like to make this more flexible, this choice of C. So let's, uh, let, let's try to do that now and let's take this C to be a random variable, but let, but let us also narrow it down and assume that this random variable is what is known maleva differentiable, which means that we can differentiate it in a certain sense. So what we do now is that we take our entropy, the absolute value, uh, have added diffusion here just to make, uh, just uh, in order to be able to play with the uh, functions that are smooth in X, so we can use the ito. Uh, so we take u epsilon and then we subtract this Krushko constant, but now we take this to be a Maleva differentiable random variable. And if you do that, you're not longer, you can no longer apply this standard E2 formula because you're going to get something which is not adapted to the underlying filtration. But there is a substitute here. 
which involves a new term where this Malayavad derivative enters uh, rather naturally. Now this comes simply from this fact. I'm applying some anticipating ETO formula, and it's anticipating because I have allowing these uh, variables here not to be adapted to the underlying filtration. So this seems crazy, but in a way it's naturally based on the problems I have just uh, discussed. So this new term is what you see here. It involves the Malayavad derivative. Uh, yeah, I, I will not take too much time talking about what the Malayavad derivative is, but if you're used to Sobolev spaces, one way of defining Sobolev spaces is that you take continuously differentiable function with compact support, and then you take this W1P norm, and you extend, first you define the derivative for this smooth function, and you extend by approximation, and the same thing you can do here. You start with some nice function H, bounded and C infinity, and you look at functionals of Brownian motion. So the first thing you can do is just evaluate these Wiener processes at different times. So this is a functional of a Brownian motion. And then you define what it means to take the derivative of some, this simple functional of Brownian motion. And this is the definition that you use. And then you try to close this operator by approximation. Right, and this is this, uh, there are many nice books and papers on how to write out the details around this. I will not go into the details, but you can do that. But the point here is that you have a derivative, so that if you take the derivative of Brownian motion, you get one. If you, take, uh, you have a chain rule, if you take the derivative of Brownian motion squared, you get this. This is, this is what you should expect, right? This is how this, uh, this calculus, this Malévar calculus is set up. Okay, so let's do this now. So what about this term here, Malava differentiable? So now I would like to convince you that if you are willing to use this, so if you now take epsilon to zero and you assume that you have a convergence to some uh, function u, then you should formally obtain what you see here. And what we suggest is that you should take this as the entropy inequality, this is what you should demand from the solution concept that these, entropy, these inequalities should hold for all Malayavad differentiable random variables V. So let's not, let me now try to convince you that L1 contraction, this is rather easy to get out if you're willing to accept this as a notion of solution. So what you do, you take as before two solutions you, 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 you take two different points, you evaluate them in T and X and S and Y, and you add these two inequalities like this. Now let us now just assume that T is bigger than S. This plays a role here because we're talking about stochastic integrals. After all, the direction of time is important. So if we, uh, we do that and add these things together, we, we get precisely what we had before in the Feng and ULI case. But what comes in is this Malayavad derivative of one of the solutions. But this one we don't see because we made this assumption that T is bigger than S. And then you will have a function that is properly adapted to the underlying filtration. So this Malayavad derivative is automatically zero. So what you have to deal with is this. And this is from this, I have taken expected values here. So there are some terms that have vanished because there are martingales. But this is basically what we had before, but we have this new term here. And this uh, look uh, singular. This one is singular, but what we are missing now is, in some sense, the term that is capturing the noise-noise interaction between these two solutions. So there's uh, some uh, quadratic term sitting here, which should sit here. So let us just subtract it, but then I have to put it here as well. So you see, I can write this as I this square here. And this noise-noise interaction term, this sigma u times sigma v is inside here, but then I have to put it in here so that this inequality is preserved. But this, t this term here now is simply zero because uh, this is a direct delta concentrating where this function turns out to be zero. Okay, so what about this? This seems pretty uh, uh, singular. Okay, so what you do here now is that you observe that comparing this with this, well, what we can do is that we can shift this um, T here to S, so they are taken at the same point, and then plus this difference. 
UOS minus UOT, if you have some kind of continuity in time or the solution with respect to the L1 norm, this term, it just goes to zero. But then the question is, what is this? This is the Malavad derivative of this stochastic entropy solution U. Uh, at S, evaluate the time T. Now, you can observe that formally, this Malavad derivative of this uh, stochastic entropy solution turns out to satisfy this continuity equation. So this is a kind of linearized stochastic transport equation or a continuity equation like this. So if you want something, if, if this, if you don't like this Malavad derivative here, what you can think of it is the solution to this linearized conservation law that you see here. So here you have the derivative, so the, uh, so the, 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 the function you're looking for is W and you have these coefficients or velocity fields, if you want, uh, the derivative of f evaluated at the solution u, and the same here with sigma of u. So what are we, what are we really asking for, and what this, co this condition that I said was rather complicated that you find in the work by Feng and Ualar, what is that really connected to? Well, it turns out this is connected to the fact that this Malavad derivative of u this solves this transport equation with initial, so you start this, so if you look at the Malavad derivative sub s here, this indicates that you're going to start this uh, problem at time s, and the initial data you start everything with is sigma of u of s. So this term here is simply asking for the solution of this transport equation, stochastic transport equation, to take its initial data in a suitable weak sense. And if you can prove that, well, then this term here, it will vanish. And you have L1 contraction. And this is the basic idea behind this uh, uh, new entropy condition. So what this uh, Malieva approach gives you, uh, besides clarifying the role uh, of this uh, work of Feng and Ollard, uh, is that it provides you with a nice way of um, getting uh, transport equations or continuity equations. This, if you take away the noise, these are equations that are very much studied in the deterministic context. But here you will see that if you linearize a stochastic conservation law using the Malavad derivative, you end up with these stochastic continuity equations with this particular noise. But of course, what makes this very difficult in general is that the field, the velocity field that we have here, compare, for example, with the first slide where we talked about the velocity field being W11. I mean, we are far from being W11 here. We have a velocity field, which is a discontinuous function. But in the one-dimensional case, uh, there are works in the deterministic case where you can define, for example, duality solutions to give sense to equations like this. But how do, you how do we avoid this uh, problem? With having a, uh, we would like to know something about this equation in order to conclude our proof. But what we do instead, I mean, this is an interesting uh, separate research project looking at a equation like this. But what we do is that uh, since we add diffusion, you compute the Malavad derivative of this uh, vis a viscous equation, and then you attempt to prove this kind of uh, continuity of initial data uh, at this level before you send uh, epsilon to zero. So this is how we actually rigorously conclude we work at the level of this viscous approximation. Uh, so how can you prove existence of these kind of solutions we are talking about now? Well, uh, one way is of course that you can put in some viscosity and you can do this um, uh, limiting argument, you can use, uh, if there is no x in sigma, you can use BV arguments, uh, uh, fractional BV estimates if you have some x dependency in the, the, in the noise volatility. Or you can write down solution concepts that use uh, V compactness techniques based on, for example, young measures, and then pass to the limit using that. A more, uh, a more interesting way, uh, from my point of view, is because it's much more constructive and you can separate uh, the, the deterministic part and the noise part. So you can try to compute solutions by some kind of splitting. So you take a small time step 
and then you solve this uh, deterministic problem for a small term that's called delta t, and you take that as a starting point for this stochastic differential equation, which you solve for a small time delta t. And then you glue these things together, and you try to prove that this converges to a solution in the sense that you have defined, like this. And one can prove that this indeed do converge uh, for general uh, problems, even with the uh, noise coefficient depending on uh, x. Uh, and moreover, uh, you can get some kind of error estimate. Uh, why is error estimate interesting here? I'm, I'm not trivial. This is because you have this, um, you're discretizing in time, and for these kind of equations, there is no, uh, again, there is no, uh, there, there is no chain rule either from a stochastic perspective or from a finite difference perspective. So, they, so this question of actually getting out rate of convergence, which is well known in the hyperbolic, uh, in the deterministic case, this is uh, significantly more difficult when you have this stochastic component because it's so rough in time, this noise. But for this particular approximation, you can get something out, which is one a third is the component, uh, exponent here. Uh, how much more time? Five minutes? Okay. All the results? Well, uh, let me leave now this, uh, and let's say that there is, uh, people have started to look at systems uh, of uh, conservation laws, um, uh, uh, particularly this uh, Euler system, compressible flow, like this. And here they want to prove, uh, let's say you can, uh, the, the natural thing to do is to add so you take this deterministic Euler system and then you add in noise like this, for example. So you add, there is a row sitting here. And you can also take some nonlinear function of this row and this, everything what these people have been doing it goes through, but a typical case could be something like this. And then you would like to prove existence of a solution here. And uh, at the level of one equation, you can prove <laughs> a uniqueness. You have L1 stability. But this is not available for this system. So what you have to do is that you have to move I have, for a good reason, not talked about this stochastic basis. I have just taken that as fixed. But when you want to go to systems for which there is no uniqueness, you, you must make this stochastic basis a part of your solution. So not only are you go, going out looking for the solution, but you're also going out looking for the information structure to which this solution is adapted. And this gives rise to something called martingale solutions or uh, probabilistic weak solutions because you're also looking for the, uh, the stochastic basis as a solution. So this is what you have to do in the stochastic case. And uh, similar things have been done for the compressible Navier-Stokes. So what do people do? Well, they, they take the weak compactness machinery that is uh, uh, well developed for the de deterministic system and then you try to apply this to the stochastic setting. And most of these uh, compactness, uh, a priori estimates and compactness properties that you know for the deterministic case, it also holds in the stochastic case where you roughly speaking think of omega as fixed. But of course, uh, so what you can prove, uh, Uh, is, if you fix omega in a sense, there is compactness because you can apply this deterministic uh, as, uh, theory. But of course, you don't know what's happening in the random variable in the, in, in the omega. And there you can easily imagine that there are oscillations preventing strong compactness from taking place because there are no a priori estimates available. But here you can resort to something that is relatively well developed in the stochastic uh, literature. This is called um, uh, this... Um, uh, this uh, Skoroholt representation theorem. So what you do is that you shift your perspective instead of looking at the solutions itself, you look at the laws. And then you show that these a priori estimates that you have uh, for, the, the, for the stochastic PDE system for each omega, that is enough to show that these laws are weakly compact. So you can extract a subsequence that converges weakly. Right. But still, you do you not know what happens in the omega direction? There might not be strong compactness. But what you do is that you, you, you use this Gorod theorem, and then you change your probability space. And then you introduce new random variables, and these new random variables, they have the same laws as, as those that you are interested in. 
but since you have shifted the probability space, you can do that in a way so that you have almost sure convergence in omega. You can get strong convergence in omega. And this is the technique or the tool you can use to, uh, to, to show at least probabilistic uh, weak solutions. They do exist when you take a system or a, a difficult deterministic PDE and you add in some noise, even though there is no underlying uniqueness re result. So there are uh, details around this. But let's stop there, Harmanu. Thank you very much.